All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you. You can have a seat. As I indicated to you before the break, both the state and the defense have now rested their cases. The attorneys will now be able to present their final arguments to you. Please remember, though, what the attorneys say is not evidence, but you should listen very carefully uh, to their remarks. They are intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side basically has the same amount of time uh, to argue to you. However, under our rules, the state is allowed to divide their time. So we will first hear uh, from Ms. Wolfson on behalf of the state, and then we'll hear from Ms. Hanania on behalf of the defense, and then we'll have a few more remarks um, from uh, Mr. Guy, I believe, on behalf of the state. So uh, that's how that'll work. And uh, depending on the length of things, we may take a break uh, somewhere along the line uh, during these arguments. But uh, please listen very attentively and carefully, um, again, as the arguments are intended to help you understand what they believe the uh, evidence showed. So, Ms. Wolfson. May I please report? Yes, ma'am. Counsel. <clears throat> Let me be very clear. There was no shotgun in that red Durango that night. There was no stick. There was no branch. There was no hollow pipe. There was no weapon. Inside that Dodge Durango were four teenagers. 19-year-old Tommy Storm, 17-year-old Kevin Thompson, 17-year-old Leland Brunson, and 17-year-old Jordan Davis. Four kids who had just left the mall. Four kids who were spending their Black Friday doing what lots of people do. Out at the mall, they were just hanging out, being kids, listening to music that they liked. When they pulled into that gas station, they had no idea what this defendant had in store for them. Stopping at the gas station so Tommy Storms could run inside and buy gum and cigarettes. Because to use their words, their breath stank. Four teenagers who were out looking for girls. 5'11", 145 pounds. And that's when he's weighed with all of his clothing and all of the items on his body. Jordan Russell Davis didn't stand a chance. Sitting behind the rear passenger side door, as bullets penetrated first the car door and then his body, as he was ducking to save his life. He was a sitting duck with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. As Michael Dunn fired round after round into their car. Each time making a conscious decision with that trigger pull. Each time with two hands on the gun, taking aim at Jordan Davis. Ten shots. That's what he fired that Friday night. Nine of them hitting his intended target. Each time intending to kill. And kill he did. Ladies and gentlemen, two worlds collided that night. Rhonda Rauer and Tommy Storms passing each other in the convenience store. 737-07. Just more than a minute would pass before this defendant decided to end Jordan Davis's life. To be exact, one minute 
than 36 seconds. That's the length of time between when the defendant started firing rounds and Rhonda Rauer walked out. The length of time that this defendant was outside getting angrier and angrier at the mouth of Jordan Davis. With malice in his heart and intent in his aim. Three of those shots went into Jordan Davis that night. The first one entering the right side of his body, ripping through his lung, his liver, his aorta, in the upwards and right to left pathway. And the only way that would have happened is his body, if his body was horizontal in the same direction as that shot. The second bullet, and these aren't in the particular order that he was shot, but the second bullet entering into his inner left thigh, or excuse me, his inner left groin, only to be lodged in his left hip. And finally, the third bullet that hit him, entering through his right back inner thigh and exiting his right inner thigh. Three shots that hit Jordan Davis within a matter of a second, less than a second as he was trying to save his own life. And after those three shots, Michael Dunn didn't stop there. He kept going. Four more shots as Tommy Thorne is throwing that car in reverse, desperately trying to get away from Jordan Davis's killer. Three of those shots hitting the side of the car. And as Tommy Storms drives off, and Jordan Davis lies in the back seat in Leland Brunson's, arm, Brunson's arms, gasping for breath, this defendant gets out of the car, walks behind his car, and keeps shooting. I anticipate at the end of this trial, Judge Healy will instruct you and read to you what the law is that applies in this case. And I anticipate he will give you numerous instructions, including one specifically on the charge of premeditated first degree murder, the charge that Michael Dunn is charged with here today. Now in all cases, there are a couple of housekeeping matters that must be proven, for example, the venue and the date. And in this particular case, the date was November 23rd of 2012, and the venue, of course, is Jacksonville, Florida, here in Duval County. Now, there are a couple of other questions that you all, as members of the jury, will ask yourselves. One was the crime that is alleged committed, and two was the defendant, the person who committed that crime. It is undisputed that Michael Dunn on November 23, 2012, killed Jordan Russell Davis. That is not an issue. The defense even said so in their opening statements. So essentially the issue at hand for you all is whether or not the defendant committed the crime, first degree murder. And it's the state's position that he very much so did. And as stated in the beginning of this case, the defendant is charged with murder in the first degree. And as stated during jury selection, it's the state's burden to prove what the defendant is charged with beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt does not apply just to everything presented in the case. It, it, it applies, excuse me, it applies specifically to the elements of the crime that is charged. Now, I anticipate His Honor will also instruct you and give you instructions on what reasonable doubt is. And it's a fairly lengthy definition, but I anticipate you will also be instructed on what reasonable doubt is not. And that is oftentimes the easier way to understand beyond a reasonable doubt. I anticipate that you will learn that a reasonable doubt is not a mere doubt. It is not a possible doubt. It is not a speculative doubt. It is not an imaginary doubt. And it is not 
a forced doubt. It is a reasonable doubt. Now the elements that beyond a reasonable doubt applies to for first degree murder are as follows. There are three of them. In order to prove the crime of first degree murder, the state must prove that Jordan Davis is dead. That the death was caused by the criminal act of Michael David Dunn and that there was a premeditated killing of Jordan Davis. I anticipate the law will go on and Judge Healy will go on to instruct you that a criminal act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Now this doesn't mean that these actions or these series of actions have to be something that was part of an elaborate plan or something that the defendant had been thinking about for weeks or days or hours. It doesn't mean that there needed to have been a blueprint that was then followed when carrying out this murder. Series of related actions simply means that Jordan Davis's death was caused by, these, by the actions of this defendant. And that these actions were for the explicit purpose of intending to kill Jordan Davis. This defendant told you himself the actions he took that night. He told you he turned his back on Jordan Davis, reached into that glove box, pulled out his gun, took it out of the holster, turned around, and then aimed it at Jordan Davis, intending to fire every single one of those shots that he did that night. Now, His Honor will also go on to instruct you on what killing with premeditation is. And killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. Meaning there's no certain amount of time that's required. There's no specific right amount of time that has to pass for that intent to form. Consciously deciding to kill doesn't mean that the defendant had to have thought about this well beforehand. The defendant didn't have to wake up on November 23rd and think, you know, today is the day I'm going to kill someone. He didn't have to think that as he pulled into the gas station. The killing with premeditation simply requires that the decision to kill is present at the time when he's aiming that gun at the SUV and firing rounds at Jordan Davis. As members of the jury, you must get the circumstances and what you believe is in the mind of the killer at the time of the actual killing. The period of time must then be long enough for reflection by the defendant, and the premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. Now it's important to note that this instruction, it doesn't say significant reflection, it simply says reflection. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you all from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. The circumstances of the killing and the sense of the number of shots that were fired, in this case 10 shots, not one, 10. And the defendant himself testified today that if he could have fired 50, he would have. Objection, Your Honor. It's a mistake of evidence. It's argument. The rule. The defendant also testified that every single, single one of those shots was intended for Jordan Davis. <clears throat> The conduct of the accused. What did the defendant do after shooting into the SUV? 
What were his actions that night? The fact that he left the gas station. Mr. Guy asked him today, could you have gone into the gas station? There were people in there. Rhonda Rauer had just been in there. Instead, he demanded of Rhonda Rauer, get in the car, get in the car. We have to leave. Now, I will also explain to you what are called lesser included offenses. And in this particular case, Michael Dunn has been charged with first degree murder, the highest charge. And underneath those two, as Ms. Corey explained to you in jury selection, there are lesser included offenses, those being second degree murder and manslaughter. And it's your job as members of the jury to evaluate the evidence and render a verdict for the highest charge that the state of Florida has proven in this case. So I anticipate that Judge Healy will also instruct you on murder in the second degree and what it is the state must prove in order to prove the charge of murder in the second degree. The state must prove once again that Jordan Davis is dead and that the death was caused by the criminal acts of Michael David Dunn. Now the state must also prove that there was an unlawful killing of Jordan Davis by an act eminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. If it is an act or series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another and is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent and is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. It is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause the death. And that's the difference between first degree murder and second degree murder. That for second degree murder to fit, the state does not prove that Michael Dunn intended to kill Jordan Davis specifically. Committing an act that will hurt someone but with no intent to kill. Stabbing someone one time with no intention to kill them, but then they ended up dying. That's an act in and of itself that is eminently dangerous. That's an act that demonstrates a depraved mind without regard for human life. Sending nine bullets into a car full of teenagers that is an act that a person of ordinary judgment would know that that act is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to someone. That act itself excuse me, indicates an indifference to human life. We have second degree murder here. But what we truly have is the premeditated murder. The fact that the defendant actually intended to kill the person he ultimately did kill. Now finally, I anticipate that His Honor will also instruct you on manslaughter. And to prove the charge of manslaughter, the state need only prove two things. And that's once again that Jordan Davis is dead and that the defendant intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Jordan Davis. For manslaughter, there is no depraved indifference to human life. It just happens. The act of pushing someone over, and then they happen to fall and die. But what the defendant did, it's not manslaughter. It's not second degree murder. What he did was premeditated first degree murder. And as I stated just a bit ago, the verdict, as Judge Healy will instruct you, must be for the highest charge that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt. We know what Michael David Dunn did on November 23rd, 2012, was first degree premeditated murder. We know that as he pulled into that gas station that night and parked next to the red SUV, he started to get angry. He didn't like the music that was coming from the car. In fact, he told Rhonda Rauer he hates, 
He hated that thug music. He didn't like it when he asked them the first time to turn down the music and they complied. But then when the music went back up, that's when he started to get angry. And the defendant really didn't like it when he asked Jordan Davis, are you talking to me? And what was Jordan's response? I'm talking to you. And then this defendant said, you're not going to talk to me that way. Reaching into his glove box and pulling out his 9 millimeter gun. Not paying attention to what's going on behind him, just taking it out of the holster, turning, aiming it at Jordan Davis, and firing off shots. Never once looking at the person he was shooting at. Mr. Guy showed him the photograph of Jordan Davis today, and the defendant didn't recognize him. Yet he claims he had such an altercation with him that they were going back and forth, having an argument, names were being called, yet he doesn't even know what the person looks like whose life he just took. He didn't care. Intent to kill. The anger of the defendant during the confrontation. When he pulled out that gun, shooting 10 times. He told you himself today that he stopped shooting when the car started moving. We all know that's not true. Tommy Storms testified the second he saw that gun come up, he threw the car in reverse, backed out, and took off as fast as he could. Bullet holes lining the passenger side of the SUV. Three more shots in the back of their car. And when the defendant first came up with a gun, he aimed exactly where he knew Jordan Davis was. He took aim at Jordan Davis' body mass. He didn't shoot out the windows. He didn't shoot at the tires. He didn't shoot at the floorboard. He shot at Jordan Davis' midsection. pound pressure with every single trigger pull. Now I know today the defendant claims that that's not exactly the case, despite the fact Marie Pagan, an expert with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, tested that gun and she performed multiple tests on that gun. And her testimony was that the trigger pull, for single action trigger pull, 6.25 pounds. That is how much pressure one would have to exert to fire that gun. And this defendant did it 10 times. And the location of the bullet holes, as I stated, he wasn't shooting at the tires, he wasn't shooting at the windows, he was shooting to kill. aiming at Jordan Davis. <clears throat> Jordan Davis's wounds speak for themselves. The fact that he was shot from the right side and the bullet lodged up in the left chest wall, or his left armpit even, and somehow was shot twice in between his legs not from sitting upright in the back seat of that car, not from being outside of the car standing up, 
ready to do whatever it was this defendant thought he was about to do. The location of his gunshot wounds is consistent with him ducking and trying to dive away from the man who murdered him. In this defendant's own words, he was aiming for Jordan Davis. He intentionally aimed that gun at that door. Any person with common sense knows bullets go through car doors. The side of Tommy Storen's vehicle. The defendant claims he rolled down his window and engaged those boys and then tried to de-escalate the situation. This is not what de-escalation looks like. Shooting into a car is not de-escalating a situation. Jordan Davis's car door. Michael Dunn was shooting to kill at 7.39 on Friday, November 23, 2012. Three shots, so close together, not only in location, but also in time. And ladies and gentlemen, you'll have the surveillance footage, and you can certainly listen to it. But those first three shots, so close in time, that the defense's own expert said it was less than half a second. There is no way that Jordan Davis was outside the car when he was shot. The piece of plastic on that back seat. Why is that important? There have been lots of suggestions and arguments and even testimony from Michael Knox, the defense's expert, that that rear back door was open. Now Michael Knox, he couldn't give some sort of estimate. His best guess was it was somewhere between open and closed. But he himself, a crime scene reconstructionist, his opinion was that that plastic somehow could have gotten there even if the door was open. Ladies and gentlemen, that piece of plastic could not have flown from the door when the bullet came through to the back seat of the car and have the door closed all in less than half a second. Tommy Storm told you all that he was reversing the car the second those shots started. Common sense tells you there's no way that this door was open and that piece of plastic that was blown out from the handle just flew through the air and landed on that back seat. It landed there because the door was closed and Jordan Davis was sitting there ducking for his life. Detective Kipple, one of the evidence technicians, he testified to those bits of glass and that plastic. And he testified that the physical evidence shows the location of not only Jordan Davis, but also of the door. Now you all have, and this is another picture of the plastic circle, now you all have seen the multiple photographs of this particular view. And I anticipate that when you look at the picture that the state put in versus the picture that Michael Knox used, who testified that it's important not to use photographs that are skewed, I anticipate you'll see that his photograph is actually very skewed with the angle of how that photograph was taken. The 
testimony of Dr. Stacy Simons. She testified at length about the gunshot wounds that Jordan Davis sustained. And she not only testified to exactly the path of these wounds and where they went, but she also testified to her opinion as to how Jordan Davis's body was. That she was leaning, that he was leaning to the left, away from his killer, which would put his body in the exact line of the trajectory of the bullet that went through his major organs. A plane that would have make, made, excuse me, the top of his liver in line with the bottom right side of his liver. And that's why that photograph of his liver was so important. It shows exactly the way his body was positioned when that bullet hit him. If that bullet had hit Jordan Davis while he was standing up, the shooter would have had to have been, as she testified, on the ground, almost underneath Jordan to get that sort of angle. And we know this isn't true. The penetrating gunshot wound, that it entered the right side, that it went through his liver, his right lung, his aorta, and then it stopped in the left chest wall. While almost simultaneously, Jordan Davis is receiving a second gunshot wound that entered his left groin from inside of the leg to the outside of his leg, lodging in his left hip. And then the third shot, yet again, almost simultaneous to the first two. An entrance back in, into the back inner right thigh and the exit wound inside of his leg. Injuries that as Stacy Simon showed you herself would only have been possible if he was inside the car leaning away from the defendant. And what did Michael Knox tell us? The $6,500 opinion. First of all, he only analyzed the Durango. And he told you all that. While he did look up police reports and things of that nature, he never once read a deposition of Tevin Thompson, Tommy Storms, or Leland Brunson. He didn't analyze the black Volkswagen Jetta. He didn't analyze Jordan Davis's wounds. What he said was that his opinion was based on a number of assumptions. That he was assuming exactly where the two vehicles were placed. That he was assuming one car wasn't farther up than the other. That he was assuming there really wasn't much of an angle between the two cars. That he couldn't tell and he was just assuming he didn't know where the firearm was that was being used. He didn't know if the arms were pulled in or pushed out when the defendant was shooting. He didn't take the defendant's position or seat into consideration when forming this opinion that that back door had to have been opened. He didn't know that window, he, he told you all how long the driver's side window was. And his statement, what happens to the shots after they pass through the door isn't really relevant. Dr. Simons, however, felt the complete opposite of that statement. As an associate with the medical examiner's office, she conducted her investigation, her analysis of Jordan Davis, formulated her opinion, and then decided, I want to know more. She went out to the scene, sat herself in the actual seat of that Durango, and looked at those dowel rods coming in that door, <clears throat> confirming her initial opinion. The opinion that Jordan Davis was in a crouched, ducking position away from the defendant when he was shot. 
How on earth could Michael Knox decide what happens to the shots after they pass through the car door isn't really relevant? When on the other side of that car door is the 17-year-old kid that this defendant murdered. How could you not take that into consideration when forming your opinion? But Michael Knox did say eventually, Jordan Davis would have had to have been leaning to the left. Mr. Guy tried to pin him down and say he was leaning to the left, his body was inside the car, and the most he would give up was that a good portion of his torso had to have been inside, but he wasn't really sure where his feet were. But he also couldn't say that his feet were on the ground. And finally, Michael Knox only listened to the audio tape, yet he gave an opinion that the shot sounded different because the front door of that store could have been open. Something he easily could have seen for himself if you watched the surveillance tape. Three more shots after the first three that hit Jordan Davis. And these three were all intended for Jordan Davis, according to the defendant. He didn't even know the car was moving after he fired shot after shot after shot. The dowels, showing the angles to the best of these ETs or the crime scene detectives' abilities. And as most all the law enforcement who dealt with these dowels testified, it's not really all that difficult to just put the dowels through the car door. And the angles are different because it's expected to be that way since the Durango was backing up for that second round of shots. And then the last three shots which the defendant also doesn't remember shooting. He claimed today that he just got out of the car, well, he thought beside the car, as opposed to what he had written in his letter that he was behind the car. And in his mind, he fired one round. But really what he did was he kept shooting as this car was driving off, as Jordan Davis was already motionless in the back seat of that Durango. This defendant had time for reflection. Every step of that process that led to the end of Jordan Davis's life was under Michael Dunn's control. He is the one who decided to insert himself, himself into their lives. They weren't bothering him. They were sitting there listening to music, being teenagers waiting for their friend to come back out with gum and cigarettes. When the defendant decided, I'm going to roll down my window and ask them to turn down their music. Now, yes, was Jordan Davis being mouthy with him? Yes, he was. Did Jordan Davis have Tevin Thompson turn that radio back up? He most certainly did. But Michael Dunn's the one who then rolled his window back down and inserted himself once again into their lives when he just wanted to make sure that they were talking to him. Did the defendant have, did he have sufficient time for reflection versus quick reflection? As stated, the law requires sufficient time, not significant. For example, if for example I wanted to come pick up this pad of paper and I thought I want to pick up that pad of paper, that was enough time for me to reflect on it prior to picking up the pad of paper. 
The defendant knew what he was doing and what he intended to do when he pulled out that gun. It's evident by the fact he didn't look for Jordan Davis when he turned back around. He didn't check to see where he was. For all he knew, Jordan Davis could have been going inside to get Tommy Storms. And the defendant thought about what he was doing. Pulling a trigger on a gun is a conscious decision. It is not something that you just put your finger on the trigger and don't think about it. And he did that ten times. Not just once, but ten. 6.25 pounds of pressure each and every time. One minute and 36 seconds. That's how long it was that Rhonda Rauer was inside the store. That's how long it, this, it took this defendant to become so angry and so upset at the 17-year-old disrespecting him that he decided to shoot to kill. That is certainly sufficient time. Would the defendant have even said anything to a car full of angry teenagers if he didn't have a 9mm? And as I say to each of those 10 shots requiring 6.25 pounds of pressure. And you as members of the jury can take into consideration his behaviors after the fact. And what he did after the fact. He flees. He says, get in the car, get in the car. He doesn't stick around and notify the police that he shot into an occupied vehicle. He doesn't go inside and tell the cashier, I need help. Nobody heard, testified that they heard the defendant yelling, he's got a gun. Instead, he orders his girlfriend into the car and they leave. Puts the gun back in the glove box and just takes off. And as Rhonda Rauer stated, he left quick. He didn't even wait for her to put on her seatbelt. And as they're pulling out of the gas station, Rhonda Rauer testified she not only saw police lights across the way, but they also passed police lights on the way back the to the hotel. And all the defendant did was keep on driving those three miles back to the Sheridan, back to where their dog was. And once they got back there, he ordered a pizza. He had Rhonda Rauer go down and get the number. But then he made the phone call for the pizza. He knew how to use his phone. He even said when he left the gas station that it was up on his dashboard because he was using GPS. He had a working cell phone, yet he just decided not to call the police. He walks his dog, his seven-month-old seven puppy. Now, yes, he didn't testify that he took the dog on a walk, but if he was in so much fear of this red SUV, why on earth would he take his puppy downstairs and let his dog use the restroom? He makes a drink, a stiff one, according to Rhonda Rauer. They each had cocktails in their hotel room, while members of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and Tevin Thompson, Leland Brunson, Tommy Storms, 
Sean Atkins, Steve Smith, the list goes on, where all these witnesses are back at the gas station telling these police officers what happened. This defendant is in his room having a rum and coke. And then when he learns that he had, in fact, killed someone at 1 in the morning, which he says he saw on his cell phone that he wasn't using to call the police for, when he finds that out, he doesn't wake up Rhonda Rauer and tell her, oh my gosh, I killed someone. He lets her sleep. And it's not until the following morning when she finds out from the news that <coughs> the defendant had actually killed someone. He doesn't tell her himself. And then at that point in time, what do they do? They get in the car and they drive home. Yes, Rhonda Rauer testified, I wanted to go home. I asked him to go home. She also said she wasn't throwing a fit. She wasn't demanding. She wasn't stomping her feet. Michael Dunn is a grown man who can make his decisions on his own. He's the one who decided to get behind the driver's seat of his car, put the keys in the ignition, and drive for two and a half hours, knowing full well what was going on in Duval County. And still, he doesn't call 911. And he makes no mention of how having a firearm and how, or having seen a firearm from the red SUV to Rhonda Rauer. He makes no mention of it. She told you all that today on the stand. And we know what she said is true based on his letter he wrote, where he reminded her two weeks after he got arrested, when I can quote it, where he says that after his meeting, After his meeting with his attorney, that the attorney mentioned in passing that I made no mention of a gun to you, based on your testimony to the, to the prosecutors. He asked what I had told you, and I then realized that we hadn't really discussed what happened, as we were more concerned with whether anyone, excuse me, as we were more concerned with whether or not anyone was hurt. He made no mention of a firearm to his fiance that night, the second after it happened. And they were more concerned of whether or not anyone was hurt. The defendant certainly wasn't calling to check on anyone. He wasn't calling the police to let them know what had happened. And when he realized what had happened, he just got in the car and drove home the next morning. The defendant's behavior after the fact. Now I anticipate, as the defense suggested in opening statement and in jury selection, that His Honor will also instruct you on what is called justifiable use of deadly force. And I'll go over those instructions with you right now. The use of deadly force is justifiable if Michael Dunn reasonably believes that the force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself while resisting another's attempt to murder him or another, or any attempt to commit aggravated assault, aggravated battery, or attempted murder upon him or another. Any attempts to commit aggravated assault, aggravated battery, or attempted murder upon or in any vehicle occupied by him. 
Now, in this particular <coughs> instance for these, this set of instructions, there is no evidence that Jordan Davis was inside the defendant's car. There is no evidence that he was touching the defendant's car. Jordan Davis did not attack the defendant in his vehicle. So this instruction right off the bat need not be considered. Now the law of justifiable use of deadly force will go on to instruct you that a person is justified in using deadly force if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or another. Or the imminent commission of these crimes, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, attempted mur murder, or murder against himself or another. Now, I anticipate you'll also get an instruction from the judge and from Judge Healy that in deciding whether the defendant was justified in the use of the force, you must judge him by the circumstances by which he was surrounded at the time the force was used. The danger facing the defendant need not have been actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious or prudent person under those same circumstances would have believed that the danger could be avoided only through the use of that force. Based upon appearances, the defendant must have believed that the danger was real. Nowhere in the jury instructions will you see the word perceived. I do not anticipate that Judge Healy will instruct you and read you instructions using that word perceived or the term perceived threat. What's important about this is that the word that is used is danger. It does not say fear, it says danger. And that the defendant must be judged by the circumstances by which she was surrounded at the time that force was used. In this case, this defendant was safely inside his car. He was in his own vehicle. <laughs> He's the one who chose to roll down his window. Jordan Davis didn't come knocking out that glass window. Now the instructions state that danger need not be actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of the danger must be so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person, not this defendant, a reasonably cautious and prudent person, would have believed that the danger could only have been avoided by using that deadly force. This jury instruction doesn't talk about the defendant's fear or what he perceives. It talks about danger. That his death was imminent. It was about to happen. Michael Dunn didn't know where Jordan Davis was when that back door was opened. He didn't even see him. How on earth is that imminent death or great bodily harm? How on earth does that justify this defendant pulling out his gun and shooting into that car ten times? The law hinges on actual defined behavior. The defendant can't just think Jordan Davis had a gun. He can't just think he's about to be threatened. He can't just hear words and think my death is imminent. The danger has to be so real. For example, a gun being put to someone's head, being threatened. And then when that person shoots the person holding the gun to his head, 
Investigation reveals there were no bullets in that gun. That is a danger that is so real, and the appearance of which is so real, that that force could be justified. The law doesn't allow for a defendant to just shoot and ask questions later. And the law doesn't allow the defendant to shoot Jordan Davis over words. Words cannot be enough to justify the use of deadly force. And as the defendant testified, when that back door popped open to him, he didn't see Jordan Davis. He didn't know where he was. That is not a threat. That is not a real danger. But in two seconds, the defendant reached over, turning his back to the threat that he thought this kid was. He turned his back to Jordan Davis, reached into his glove box, pulled out his gun, came up shooting. There was a shield between the defendant and Jordan Davis if that door was open. That shield was the car door. There's been testimony that Kevin Thompson couldn't have gotten out of the car. The defendant himself said the cars were too close. <coughs> How on earth is Jordan Davis in a threat if somehow that door's open and he's behind it? And remember, the standard is not the defendant. The standard is a reasonably cautious and prudent person. Would a reasonably cautious and prudent person then fire 10 shots into the car? All of where the body mass was? There were no shots being fired towards him. There was no gun found. One of those shots went into the crowded parking lot somewhere because it missed the car. And the defendant then returns the gun to the glove box, doesn't take it out again and blames that on Rhonda, that because Rhonda Rauer, his fiance, told him not to take it out, he listened to her and did not. And then again, his behavior after the, sh the shooting. And the law states that the danger could only be avoided through force. Rolling up his window, staying in the car. Instead, the defendant gets out of the car to keep shooting as the cars the SUV is driving off. And he told the detectives that he, saw, he thought maybe Jordan Davis was already diving back into the car when he grabbed his gun. That's not a danger if someone's back is towards you. And Jordan Davis couldn't even get to the defendant. Is this really self-defense? There wasn't a scratch on his car. Jordan Davis was getting out of that car to do damage to the defendant. I guarantee you he would have slammed open that back seat door. He wouldn't have cared if it left marks on the Jetta or the Durango. Ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Davis was not by that car. The way he was shot and the way Officer Holmes found him, that's how we know he was inside the back of that SUV. Officer Holmes testified last week that when he opened that back passenger door, Jordan Davis was slumped over to the left, his head in Leland Brunson's lap, his shoulder on his thigh, and his rear end 
in the air. A position consistent with what Dr. Simon said. Jordan Davis didn't put himself in that position after he got shot three times. He was in that position because he was ducking and hiding and trying to save his life. I anticipate His Honor will also instruct you on how to go about weighing the evidence. And there's a variety of different um, points that you all can take into consideration, including that the witness seemed to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? These are all things that you as members of the jury can use along with your common sense when deliberating this case. Now, of course, the state knows that not every single person on that witness set stand said the exact same thing. I submit that if they did, the state of Florida would have a big problem. This is real life. This is not CSI or other crime shows. But people do see things differently. And two years later, they may see things or say things that don't all match up. But what they all told you is what they remember happening that day. And they are all consistent. All of them consistent. That they never saw a weapon come out of that SUV. They never saw a shotgun. They never heard the defendant say, Oh, he has a gun. That Sean Atkins, Steve Smith, the gate employees, Alyssa and Christopher LeBlanc, who were down in the plaza not knowing what had gone on at the gate station. And what they told you all was that they saw that red SUV come barreling down the outer parking lane. And when it stopped, they saw two black males get out of the front passenger seat and the driver's seat. Now, they couldn't tell you exactly what they were doing, but they saw them look into the rear passenger seats and then get back in the car, hightail in reverse, back to that gate station. They each testified they didn't see anyone throw anything from the vehicle. They didn't see any, any weapons sticking out of the vehicle. They simply saw Tommy Storms and Tevin Thompson looking at the back seat at a dying Jordan Davis. The only person, the only one out of however many days of testimony we had who ever mentions a firearm or a weapon of any kind being in that SUV is this defendant. And he doesn't even mention a firearm, clearly. He tells the detectives the day after that it could have been a stick. He's not really sure if it was a firearm, maybe a shotgun, but he knows they had something. Having something does not justify deadly force. The defendant's own statements and the inconsistencies of them. He stated today that when he pulled up, the bass wasn't playing. It started when Rhonda Rauer got out of the car, but she testified she heard that bass too because she knew the defendant hated that music and he told her that. He stayed wrote in his letter, two young men with menacing expressions. Yet to the detectives, he said, I don't know how many kids in that car. He said, Jordan Davis stepped out of the car, then comes back and said, oh, he just opened the door. And the number of drinks he had, according to Rhonda Rauer, he had three or four at the wedding. The defendant to the police, he had a toast and a drink. 
And then one question by Mr. Guy, he, I guess, calculated the size of his drinks and decided it was a drink and a half. His testimony in court, that Jordan Davis said to him something, something cracker, something he never told the detectives the day after, the morning after this incident. I should effing kill that mother effer. Something he now claims Jordan Davis said to him. He never told that to the detectives either. And he says that Jordan Davis slammed whatever it was against the door. And he also never told that to the detectives. And then the phrase that really set him off to where the defendant felt he was being killed. This shit is going down now. He didn't tell that to the detectives either. How could the defendant not tell homicide, invest homicide detectives who are investigating a homicide that this defendant was involved in? How could he not tell them that that was the trigger statement for him, that that was a statement when he thought he was truly in fear? And then his own statement. You are not going to kill me, you son of a bitch. He didn't tell the detectives that he said that to Jordan Davis. Steve Smith, an independent witness, he heard the defendant. You're not going to talk to me that way. And the defendant's inconsistencies didn't just stop with his statements to the police about what Jordan Davis and his And then the defendant testified today, he doesn't remember saying, I hate that thug music. Rhonda Rauer certainly remembered that. The defendant's version that Rhonda Rauer told him to leave the gun in the car because she felt weird about the situation. Rhonda Rauer doesn't say that's the case. And the defendant saying that he did, in fact, tell Rhonda Rauer that he saw a gun that night. Why on earth would Rhonda Rauer lie about that? Not only did Rhonda's own statement today that he never mentioned the gun, but also that letter that I read to you all that confirms that this defendant never told her about a firearm. Is everyone else to blame for this? It's not some conspiracy against Michael Dunn. What happened on November 23rd of 2012 was a direct result of his actions. The defense blames Jordan Davis for escalating the situation. Jordan Davis was in his car listening to his own music when the defendant inserted himself into their lives, not once, but twice. Tevin Thompson, Leland Brunson, Tommy Storms. What, for driving away from the scene? They were fleeing this defendant. They were trying to escape and save their lives. And the second they knew Jordan Davis had been hit, where did they go? Straight back to the gas station to help. That's where, where they went. If they had had a gun, I guarantee you they would have taken off. And the 911 callers, Alyssa and Chris LeBlanc. Yes, Chris LeBlanc stated they maybe were stashing something in the car, but he couldn't tell. But as I stated earlier, they didn't see anything get thrown from the car. They didn't see any weapons. They simply saw the car go straight back to the gas station. Steve Smith, an independent witness. The defendant denies saying that statement. Mr. Smith didn't just make that up out of spite against this defendant. He testified to what he heard that night. And what he heard was Michael Dunn telling Jordan Davis, you're not going to talk to me like that. Words showing his intent, 
Words showing his anger and words showing that he'd had enough. He'd been disrespected. He'd been challenged. And he was done. Sean Atkins, 25-time convicted felon. He came in here and demonstrated exactly the position he saw the defendant in when he was outside of that car shooting. He also had the wherewithal to write down the tag number and go into that gas station despite being on probation at the time, despite having missed an appointment with his probation officer. And that goes for Tommy Storms as well. He knew he was out violating his probation. <clears throat> but instead of fleeing the scene, they all went back to the scene. Such a stark contrast to what the defendant and his fiance were doing. While the boys in that car drove 320 feet and then reversed it right back, this defendant drove over three miles to his hotel and then another two and a half hours the next morning before ever doing anything about the situation. And even then, when he gets back home, he only goes to his neighbor's house because he first had a call from Detective Mark Musser with the homicide unit. He didn't willingly turn himself in. He knew he had been caught. He knew at that point in time he couldn't run any longer. In law enforcement, there are lots of questions to the police officers about the perimeter and searching the dumpsters. There is no testimony that that red SUV or anyone from inside of that red SUV went anywhere near dumpsters, the back of the gate, excuse me, the back of the gate station, anywhere on the far right side of it. There's no testimony to that. They went 320 feet away and reversed straight back. And Maria Pagan, the defendant himself today, challenged her testimony when he said that gun does not have a 6.25 trigger pull. And then Dr. Simons and her testimony of the wound pass on Jordan Davis. And finally, Rhonda Rauer. The defendant blames her for an awful lot. He blames her for leaving town the next morning. He blames her when, for leaving the gun in the glove box when I guess he was in such fear that he thought every single car was a red SUV. This isn't a case where everyone conspired against the defendant. He is guilty of first degree murder and that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we are here today. His actions that night and his behavior after the facts prove just that. You are not going to talk to me that way. Getting his gun from the glove box for a threat and a danger that didn't even exist that the defendant didn't even know what was going on. He didn't know where Jordan Davis was or what was going on. But he did know that he was going to shoot to kill once he grabbed his gun out of that glove box. He didn't come up and wave it and say, I have a gun. He just came up firing, round after round after round. And when the detectives asked, about the shotgun, and they said, could you have imagined it? His response, anything is possible. Two worlds collided that night on November 23, 2012, with no greater difference in their reactions to the event they just experienced. Tommy Storms on probation, Sean Atkins, violating his probation, living out of his car. They all went back to the scene that night. They all went back and told the police what they saw had happened. And the other two, Michael Dunn and Rhonda Rauer, driving off to their hotel, not thinking it was important enough 
to call the police. Going back to have a pizza, make a stiff drink, walk their dog, and then drive back to Brevard County, Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Dunn has now had his day in court. He had his right to a trial, to be judged by a jury of his peers, and that day has finally come. Today is the day that you all, as members of the jury, will define this defendant's actions that night. And you all will define what happened to Jordan Davis. The defendant may have silenced Jordan Davis forever, but he cannot <coughs> silence the truth. He cannot silence this jury from rendering a verdict consistent with the evidence and consistent with the law and consistent with your common sense. And that's a verdict that speaks for the truth <coughs> and a verdict that speaks what, uh, for what happened. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a verdict of guilty as charged. Thank you, Ms. Wolfson. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we'll hear from Ms. Hannity on behalf of Mr. Dunn. So 15 minutes, don't discuss the case among yourselves. We'll be back at 4 o'clock.